Joanna Catherine Rogers was born in Lubbock, Texas on June 25, 1987. At the age of 16, Joanna was a junior at Lubbock High School and was active in theater, debate, dance, and student publications. On May 4, 2004, Joanna was home with her family when she strangely disappeared around midnight. An Amber Alert was issued, but they were unable to locate her. Her mother, Kathy, said Joanna's favorite coat, wallet, car keys, and phone were all left in her bedroom. Three weeks into her disappearance, more than 700 people showed up to help search for Joanna, but no sign of her was ever found. As Joanna's 17th birthday rolled around, her parents still had no idea what happened to her. Investigators would eventually stumble on some online chats between Joanna and a man named Rosendo Rodriguez III. Investigators tried to interview Rodriguez, but were unable to do so because he was out of town on military training. As a result, his name subsequently went to the bottom of the list in Joanna's investigation. Over a year after Joanna disappeared, on September 13, 2005, Workers at the Lubbock City Landfill spotted a brand new suitcase that looked out of place. They found it odd that someone would throw away a new suitcase that still had a plastic tag on the handle. So they decided to look inside, and that's when they made a horrifying discovery. There, folded into a fetal position, was a deceased young woman's body. There was nothing to identify the woman other than a tattoo on her ankle that read Summer. The autopsy determined that she had died about 24 hours before being found. She had been sexually assaulted and suffered multiple blunt force trauma wounds all over her body, and someone tried to strangle her. She was also five weeks pregnant, which made the case a capital murder case. She had suffered severe enough injuries, enough to lose consciousness, but had no specific injuries that would have caused her death. This fact led the pathologist to conclude that because of the way she was stuffed in the suitcase, she died of positional asphyxiation. In other words, she was alive when she was put in the suitcase. Finally, she was identified as 29-year-old mother of four Summer Lee Baldwin by using her driver's license fingerprints. Summer was originally from Tacoma, Washington, but had turned to prostitution to fund her drug addiction habit. On the inside of the suitcase was a small tag with a UPC number on it. From there, detectives determined the possible places in Lubbock where someone could buy that particular suitcase. Detectives concluded that the suitcase was bought from Walmart. Employees at Walmart were able to obtain video surveillance of the person who purchased them. One buyer was a woman and the other was a Hispanic man. The woman was quickly ruled out as a suspect. The Hispanic man had a close-cut hairstyle and was wearing a green shirt. Thankfully for investigators, the man stupidly purchased the suitcase and a package of latex gloves with his debit card. He was also seen on camera driving a red full-size pickup truck leaving Walmart at 3.30 a.m. It was soon determined that the suspect was none other than Rosendo Rodriguez. He was in the Marine Corps Reserves and had come to Lubbock for his monthly reserve training the weekend Summer was murdered and had stayed at a hotel near where Summer was last seen. Warrants were issued for his arrest and it took some time to track him down, but when they did, he was arrested at his parents' home in San Antonio, Texas. He immediately invoked his right to counsel. At his parents' house, the police recovered the shirt he wore in the Walmart security video and his laptop. Although Rodriguez never asked investigators why he was being questioned, a forensic search of his computer revealed searches about Summer and Joanna. He had spoken with Joanna twice the night she went missing and suspiciously never called her again after that night. Detectives pressed Rodriguez first about Summer. Rodriguez claimed that after having consensual sex with her, she pulled out a knife and threatened him. He said he killed her in self-defense. However, his calm demeanor in Walmart and lack of defensive cuts from the alleged knife fight refuted his claims. In Midland, the red truck that Rodriguez rented was photographed and processed. Through the debit card information, 
Detectives learned that the defendant stayed at the Holiday Inn downtown. He was the only one in his unit who stayed at that hotel. Everyone else stayed at a different Holiday Inn. A search of the room he'd stayed in, which was still uncleaned, turned up traces of blood on the carpet and bed, a Walmart receipt, and a used pair of latex gloves. Forensic experts analyzed the blood in the room and found it matched Summer's. They also found Summer's DNA on the outside of the latex gloves. The genetic material inside the gloves belonged to Rodriguez. Detectives learned that he had entered his room around 12.30 a.m. the day Summer was murdered by looking at the report generated when a keycard was used for a particular room. Witnesses had seen Summer with a Hispanic man with a short haircut driving a red pickup at around midnight that morning. The keycard also showed the defendant entering the room again at approximately 3.50 a.m., about 20 minutes after buying the suitcase. He left again at some point and returned to the room later that morning. He had searched on his computer for Summer Baldwin and stories about her body's discovery in the landfill. He had also visited websites for singles, military singles, and many others. Rodriguez's attorney turned over two knives that belonged to Summer and stated that Rodriguez wanted to speak with investigators. He claimed that he and Summer had consensual sex and that she started smoking crack afterward. He said this made him mad, so he grabbed the crack pipe, and then Summer came at him with two knives. He said he put her in a chokehold, and she died while he protected himself. He must not know that it takes several minutes to strangle someone to death or unconscious. The investigator kept thinking about Joanna going missing two years earlier. Rodriguez's name had come up during that investigation because he had been on an online chat page with Joanna. As police searched his computer, they found he was the last person who had been chatting online with Joanna right before she went missing. Authorities believed he had something to do with her disappearance, so they made a deal. If Rodriguez told them what happened to Joanna, they would waive the death penalty in Summer's capital murder case. Rodriguez took the deal, and in a taped confession, he told police he secretly met Joanna in the early morning of May 4, 2004, for consensual sex. He said she told him she was just 16 and threatened to blackmail him. Some reports say he claimed that she demanded money afterward. A fight supposedly ensued, and he claimed he killed her in self-defense as well. He casually said he went to his room, found a suitcase, put Joanna in it, and threw her in a dumpster. Since the landfill keeps records of where trash is taken, detectives figured out which dumpster would have contained Joanna's body, and then the approximate area of the landfill where that dumpster would have been emptied. The site was several football fields in length, with nearly three years' worth of garbage stacked over it. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. For two months, men and women searched the landfill for that suitcase, wearing body suits in the high temperatures, risking illness, and getting shots for preventative measures. Sheriff David Gutierrez, along with Pam Alexander, victim advocate extraordinaire, secured a grant from the governor's office for $100,000 to help with the cost of searching the landfill. On the last day they were going to dig, Rodriguez ended up withdrawing his plea deal so the state sought the death penalty. That same day, the final day of the search, another black suitcase was found and contained the remains of Joanna. On the day of his plea, Rodriguez, a highly intelligent, college-educated Marine, stated he didn't understand what was going on and would not enter a guilty plea. So the prosecutor withdrew the offer and filed a notice of intent to seek the death penalty. Not only was Joanna found, the jury would decide if her killer should get the death penalty for his crimes. In 2008, during the trial for Summer's murder, the prosecutor had to convince the jury that you could, in fact, sexually assault a prostitute and that the defendant didn't have to know that the victim was pregnant to convict him of murdering the unborn fetus. It was the first time the jury, Rodriguez, and his attorney heard of how Summer was still alive when she was placed in the suitcase. This fact destroyed the self-defense claim because of his calm demeanor in Walmart and lack of defensive cuts from the alleged knife fight. In the trial, 
The state also brought forward several women who said Rodriguez had sexually assaulted them in the past. These included his first high school girlfriend, whom he had sexually assaulted, and four other women he had terrorized and raped during his time at Texas Tech. The sexual assault victims told the same story. The defendant would use his charm and looks to get them to have sex with him. However, the sex would quickly turn violent, and each victim testified how the defendant would continue to rape them despite their fighting and pleading with him to stop. The victims testified that they did not tell anybody about these rapes because they were terrified of Rodriguez. He had a great ability to pick perfect victims who wouldn't report his crimes. His friends also testified that Rodriguez had no problems getting women and described sex as a handshake. They also said he bragged about having prostitutes and killing kids in Iraq with the Marine Corps. Of course, that last part was clearly a lie because Rodriguez had never been deployed anywhere. One of his victims said that during her senior year at Texas Tech, she joined the Cairo fraternity, where she met Rodriguez. She admitted to being very naive and quickly fell in love with him. She said he had done everything right, even asking her father permission to date her. But one day, she learned he was cheating on her, so she went to his apartment to confront him and break up with him. That's when he held her down on the couch and raped her, taking her virginity. He then walked her to the car, patted her head, and told her she would be all right. Detectives had recovered all the text messages and pictures from Rodriguez's phone. One photo in particular was shown to the jury. It was a selfie of Rodriguez in mirrored sunglasses, smiling, wearing the same green shirt he wore in the Walmart video, and was on a bus back home to San Antonio. This picture was taken the day after he killed Summer. The smiling picture clearly shows his true character. The media dubbed him the suitcase killer because of how he disposed of his victims. The prosecution was prohibited from announcing or playing Rodriguez's confession regarding Joanna's murder. The reason is because of a messed up law that considers his statement as not voluntary because it was part of a plea agreement. Even though the defendant backed out of the plea, it was still inadmissible. Regardless, the jury returned with a guilty verdict after a short deliberation. During the victim impact statement, the jury learned for the first time from Joanna's father that the defendant had killed his daughter. His execution was scheduled for March 27, 2018, one day after his 38th birthday. Bizarrely, he yelled against the death penalty and urged everyone to boycott businesses in Texas until they were forced to stop the death penalty. After several minutes of ranting, Rodriguez was injected with pentobarbital and died 22 minutes later. To this day, it's unknown if there are other victims, but there's one thing for sure, this SOB will never hurt another soul ever again. Lee Gonzalez Rodatori was born in North Dakota on September 29, 1949, to Clifford and Gwen Gonzalez. In 1978, she would marry Gerald Nimke, who went by Jerry, but they divorced a year later, then remarried in December 1981, and ended up having a son together. She was described as mostly happy and outgoing with lots of friends and earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of wisconsin Monomoy. In June 1982, at the age of 32, Lee moved over 600 miles from Nunico, Michigan to Council Bluffs, Iowa to work at the nearby Jenny Edmondson Hospital as a food service director. While waiting for permanent housing, she stayed at the Best Western Frontier Motor Lodge Hotel for several nights. The motel has since been renamed to the Best Western Crossroads of the Bluffs and sits just off I-29 and the I-80 interchange. Lee was by herself for the time being, but her husband and son had made plans to join her at some point. Lee started orientation for her new job on Monday, June 21st. Three days later, on Thursday afternoon, she went boating on Lake Manawa with some new friends from the hospital and picked up dinner at McDonald's on her way back to her hotel room. 
The next morning, on June 25, 1982, Lee's boss called the hotel because she failed to show up for her first official day of work. When the hotel staff checked her room, they found Lee's lifeless body. She had been sexually assaulted and suffered a single stab wound to the heart. Her employer and other local organizations put up rewards for thousands of dollars hoping for answers, but those answers never came. Jerry was initially considered a person of interest and had a criminal history. In 1960, at the age of 17, Jerry beat a 16-year-old waitress named Marilyn Duncan to death with a brick in Chicago, Illinois. He was convicted and sentenced to death, but it was overturned on appeal because his preliminary hearing was determined not to have been done fairly. He was retried and again convicted and sentenced to 75 years. He was released early on parole and then married Lee. This case would remain unsolved until 2001 when DNA technology had improved enough to submit the evidence collected in 1982 to the state crime lab for examination. A male DNA profile was found, but there were no matches in state or federal databases. DNA from Lee's crime scene was used for genetic genealogy but the closest relative match in genealogy databases was the suspect's six to eight cousins. Then in 2020, genealogist college student Eric Schubert, who has since graduated and owns his own business named ES Genealogy, assisted Parabon researchers in their quest. He was quickly able to get to the grandparent of the suspect. From that, the family tree branched into numerous branches with hundreds of connected relatives. As those names were provided to investigators, they reached out to family members to request their assistance, and most were happy to submit a DNA kit to help. Then a man police hadn't contacted submitted a DNA kit that Parabon flagged, which narrowed the case down to a pair of brothers. Based on the men's ages and the date of the crime, one was quickly ruled out because he was too young at the time. The other brother was Thomas Oscar Freeman of West Frankfort, Illinois. Investigators were able to positively identify Freeman as Lee's killer after his daughter agreed to give a DNA sample, officially solving the case after 40 years. Freeman himself couldn't provide any DNA because, as it turns out, he was murdered just a few weeks after Lee was murdered. His body wasn't discovered until three months later in a shallow grave in a wooded area near his home outside of Cobden, Illinois, on October 30, 1982. Police believe Freeman killed Lee while passing through the area as a trucker. He had been shot to death, and his killer was suspected to be Lee's husband. Authorities said after prison, Jerry went to college in Carbondale, Illinois, about 15 miles from Cobden, where Freeman's body was found, and the two men were possibly previous acquaintances. Jerry had given a DNA sample to detectives in 2011 and by that time was living in Florida. He died in March 2019 and remains a person of interest in Freeman's murder. Victoria Barron was born on August 5, 1969, to Harry and Bernarda Barron and went by Vicky. Sadly, when Vicky was 10 years old, her father suddenly passed away. In school, Vicky played basketball, was on the cheerleading squad, and was said to be a very friendly person. After her father died, her mother would marry Luz Barrera, who would become a great father figure in her life. Vicky would eventually have two children with Juan Cirillo, who lived a troubled life in and out of prison. Vicky then married Gilbert Rodriguez and had two more children. However, that marriage to Gilbert wouldn't last after they had been on and off again for nearly two decades. At age 35, Vicki moved from Level Land, Texas to the 600 block of Avenue L in Rawls, Texas with her 13-year-old daughter, Amy. Several weeks after relocating, tragedy struck. On January 6, 2005, a man unknown to Vicki and Amy showed up at their new home asking for a man named Lalo. They said that they didn't know the man and explained they had only lived there less than a month and had no idea who the man was. The man he was looking for had rented the home before Vicky and Amy moved in. 
He was persistent about finding Lalo and left and returned several times. He repeatedly asked Vicky what time it was and where Lalo was. He appeared to be under the influence of drugs and was asked to leave several times. Vicky was in the living room with her then-boyfriend, her cousin Joanna, and Joanna's boyfriend. Amy was in her bedroom looking after Joanna's young children. After 10 p.m., the man came back and began beating on the door. When Vicky went back outside, the man stabbed Vicky, leaving her to die. Joanna's boyfriend burst into Amy's room and frantically told her to stay in her room no matter what, leaving Amy confused and concerned. But she convinced herself he was drunk and that nothing was actually wrong. That is, until she noticed the music had stopped in the living room. So she got off the phone with her friend and started to walk out of her bedroom door. She then witnessed bloody shoe prints in the living room leading through the kitchen and outside. The only door they ever used was the back door, but there was no light on the back porch. So all Amy saw was complete darkness as she called out for her mother. She then heard moaning in the backyard and Amy panicked as she finally focused enough to see that her mother was lying face down on the last step. Amy took off running down the street where she knew a paramedic lived. First responders and the police quickly arrived and rushed Vicki to the hospital. She was then flown to the University Medical Center in Lubbock, Texas. She was in the hospital unresponsive and on life support for three days until she sadly passed away. The same paramedics that transported Vicky to the hospital called the police to tell them they found a man fitting the description of the assailant with a bloody shirt walking down the highway. Daniel Guerrero was found and arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. A jury would find Guerrero guilty of murder and sentenced to 99 years in prison with the eligibility for parole in 2035. The reason for Guerrero's actions is still unclear, but he has left Vicky's family shattered. It's scary to know that Guerrero could someday walk the streets again as a free man.